Hi there, my name is Travis Kinworthy. I'm, I'm here with my colleague and good friend Jim Danza, and we are at the uh, Santa Clara River. We're, we're both involved with the Friends of Santa Clara River, it's a nonprofit organization that helps uh, protect and uh, conserve natural resources. Give us a little bit of intro about the Friends of Santa Clara River and what and uh, what you do. Well, Friends started in 1993 with the idea to be the voice of the river, to, to protect the cultural and biological aspects of the river. We do lots of education. Um, we bring uh, groups out to do restoration projects. And we have a piece of land called the Hedrick Ranch Nature Area that we use for restoration. We've restored uh, nearly 100 acres and birds are coming back and they love it. Oh, fantastic. So tell us a little bit about where, where we are here and what we're looking at. Now, you're, you call this the river, but I don't, I don't see any, <laughs> any water. So, um, you know, what's going on here, Jim? Well, <laughs> where, where's the water? Well, well who said uh, rivers had have water in it all the time? <laughs> if you think that, you're probably from the east or, or maybe Europe or somewhere. Uh, but rivers in this drier climate um, flow typically in the winter time um, after a significant winter rains. And the rest of the time, it still provides lots of habitat. Uh, you see lots of trees, you hear some birds, and it's actually really vital habitat that's becoming really rare here in Southern California. Definitely don't want to be in the river when there's any significant amount of, of water, because uh, it'd be really dangerous and very often it's hard to actually get out of the river once you're in a current. Um, but you know, those rushes of, of water that happen occasionally is really critical for the coast because the sand on the beach literally comes from this river for most of the uh, Ventura County. Look at the sand and gravel here. It's re really, really coarse, which will allow water to infiltrate through. So when the river is flowing, it's adding water to our groundwater table. The groundwater table here in Oxnard Plain is critical to farms in the, in the cities in the whole area. So, you know, having a river with this natural bottom is a really important part of the story of where we get our water from. Now, if we were to like, you know, dig down into the sand, would we eventually run into some water or? Well, you would hit, hit water um, actually pretty quick. Um, you can see from the, uh, some of the green shrubs here that survive year-round, um, the water's not uh, all, all that deep, really. Um, okay. Some places, uh, we're here on the Oxnard Plain area, um, sometimes as little as eight feet you'll hit some sort of water table. Um, but the water that the cities use is, is much deeper, and unfortunately it's getting deeper um, with, sure. uh, with all the droughts that we're having. You can see some of the size of these boulders here. When that thing came tumbling down the river, it was a big, big flood. Hard to know, but that could have been like the 1969 flood, um, which was the last really large, significant flood that we had here. But to move boulders like this, to have them tumble and get rounded in this river, just shows you how powerful the, the river is. So as you can see here, the river is cutting into that embankment, um, causing erosion. So some of the concerns of living on the Oxnard Plain and other places upstream is that erosion of the size of the river um, can threaten structures, or if the flows are too high, the river could rise high enough to cause flooding. So Jim, we're, we're standing here in the, in the riverbed again, um, and yeah, notice all this vegetation we have around us. Uh, what's the importance of, you know, trees like this and, and the, some of the brushes and shrubs we, we see, and, and why do we care, and why should we protect them? Well, the ones behind us here are native to this area. And so they are prepared for drought, they're prepared even for flooding. For example, the uh, willow here uh, can break off a stick and flow downstream, get buried, and it, it will start growing. A lot of wetland plants, they absorb um, pollutants. Um, without the right plants, you don't get the right animals. So by having these native plants here, we get um, the birds that belong here, the insects, the, the wildlife. It's all one ecosystem. Everything we're looking at right here, is this, this is all native uh, plants that we're surrounded with? Well, these are, but let's take a look at some non-native ones that have invaded the space and actually prevent these from growing. Tamarisk, it's an invasive plant that um, takes over a lot of the habitat. Uh, very little, if anything, will grow in between this. And the issue is, there may not be um, 
animals that use this plant and it's taking away space uh, for the native plants. Also, this particular one um, uses a lot of groundwater. It's phenomenal how much one tamarisk tree can uh, suck up groundwater. Um, and if you have several, it really does change the habitat. Um, down below here is, uh, is mustard. It's pretty, it makes our hillsides look golden in the spring, uh, but it's again, uh, invasive. It has taken over what looks like bamboo. It's called a rundo. Rundo is uh, the world's largest type of grass. And it was imported from the Middle East for erosion control. But unfortunately, it takes over whole zones of habitat in a really uh, thick area where nothing else will grow. And there's no significant amount of animals, birds, or anything that uses it. Uh, so it's quite destructive to the native habitats here. It changes the ecology, it changes the, the, the fire scenarios that are natural to this area. Uh, someone's toolbox, I don't know if it washed downstream or was left by someone. I would recycle that. I don't know if I would reuse it or not, but... Oh! This bag was made to store chips for, I don't know, maybe three months and it was eaten in a matter of seconds probably, but this bag will be around possibly for decades, especially with a foil liner. Your river will only be as clean as your watershed is. Um, we're a little bit fortunate in the Santa Clara River because most of the watershed is national forest, or at least a lot of it is. With it, uh, largely national forest, it's a little bit cleaner than some rivers. I don't even want to touch that. Like a, like a water bottle. Oh. What if the river yeah, did you this? Could, you could reuse that, couldn't you, Jim? I could recycle it. And one thing to remember is your drinking water is filtering, filtering through this trash. There's my other sock. We're looking here at one of the tributaries to the river. Tributaries are the smaller streams that flow into the main river. Because of runoff from cities and farms, very often they get more water than the river would actually have during the dry periods. You can see it's supporting lots of great habitat. When the watershed is clean, that's when we'll have clean water. This one here is from an urban area. So you'll see some trash scattered about. This will eventually flow down to the main river and end up at the beach. That's nasturtiums. You can buy those seeds at a garden shop. But that's an example of a plant that escaped from someone's yard and now is a non-native plant invading into what otherwise would be a natural habitat. The benefit of this tributary, which has these beautiful trees, is it's way cooler here in a great place to walk. You're in the shade, you see the vegetation and the, the plants, maybe some animal life. What more can people do at local residents do to enjoy the river more and, and even get, uh, get better access to it? Well, it's uh, quite restrictive right now, uh, but access is improving um, in the next few years. There's going to be places where the public um, can go and enjoy the river. Um, for now, you can go to places like this, where we have um, bike trails uh, in a few segments along the river. Uh, Fillmore has some, Santa Paula, Ventura, Snart area. If you, uh, there's a small bike trail over the river near Victoria as it goes toward Oxnard. Uh, Friends of the Santa Clara River in the Sierra Club received a grant from the National Park Service to study this loop trail um, concept. And so that study will get us ready for grants. The grants might be related to clean air and uh, climate change and recreation and, and health for cities. Obviously people live here. They live along the Santa Clara River and that's where this trail will have this loop. And eventually we hope to get extensions all the way down to the ocean. Oh, that's great. Yeah, so people can recreate with families, get around, commute. And also for disadvantaged communities, um, people can ride their bikes safely um, to work. If people wanted to find out you know, more about the river and how they can get involved and maybe even donate to the cause, do you have a website that they can go to? Yes, our website is fscr.org. One of the things we need is just participation and awareness um, because we'll be calling on citizens in the future to 
advocate for the river. Most people don't know about this river. And so the more that people know about it and they know what resources it offers, and how they're part of the river, um, you know, being the, they're drinking the water from it indirectly, um, you know, that active citizenry will help us uh, convince cities and counties to protect the river and enhance it and make it accessible uh, for people and for schools, for education. Uh, I teach at Oxnard College and there's very few places I can bring my students to, to learn about rivers. Um, but as that changes over time, you'll start to realize, wow, the river is really part of the city and, and the resource. Sure. Well, thanks again, Jim, for your time today. It's been like, very informative. And I want to thank the, the viewers for tuning in and watching this, uh, this great content. And uh, yeah, again, if you have any questions, go to the website, www.fscr.org.